Welcome to the Commercial Mechanical Requirements of the 2006 International Energy Conservation Code training video brought to you by the U.S. Department of Energy. You now can receive .10 CEUs towards ICC renewal certification and or 1.0 AIA CES learning units. However, in order to obtain AIA LUs, new AIA requirements dictated tests must be taken. At the end of this training video, you will be directed to a website to take the 10 question test, applicable to AIA members only. You must answer eight of the 10 questions correctly in order to qualify for the 1.0 learning unit. The ECP will report the AIA members who pass the test so credit can be awarded. A certificate of completion will also be available at the end of this training video. Hello, my name is Eric Mackle from Brit Mackle Group, and I'd like to welcome you to this morning's session covering the commercial mechanical requirements of the 2006 International Energy Conservation Code brought to you by the Building Energy Codes Program. Just a little bit about me and uh, the Brit Mackler Group. Um, we focus on helping states adopt and implement um, essentially the International Energy Conservation Code. And are currently working uh, quite a bit in Nevada right now and also up in the Idaho uh, to get the new codes in place. Um, I'm also serving on the IECC Code Development Committee and served on the last two code change cycles for 2004 and 2006, so are fairly familiar with a lot of the provisions and changes that went into the end of the 2006 code. What we're going to try to accomplish today in the time we have is, one, provide an overview of the 2006 mechanical requirements in the IECC, and I think you'll see that there's not a lot of changes uh, from the 2003 IECC requirements, so we will do a uh, kind of a compare and contrast between the two codes, and I'll try to point out along the way what what was in the code before and what's brand new to the code. Um, make sure that you ask questions. Uh, again, we will answer questions at the end of the session, but you can go ahead and email in the questions uh, as they come, and uh, just to make sure we can get as many of those answers as possible. So with that, let's go ahead and start in the, uh, in the presentation. First thing I want to do is kind of cover what the compliance process is within the 2006 IECC, and this really hasn't changed that much from the 2003 IECC. The primary changes are some of the reference standards that are, are been updated since the um, since the code came in. Um, the first thing you always do is start with, does my project have to comply with the energy code? And this is typically the first question that must be answered in any project. If you have a new building, it's a fairly straightforward answer. The answer will be yes. Your building envelope will have to comply. The mechanical system will have to comply. And also the lighting system will have to comply. And what's not shown on this chart, but what's included in the code, is the requirements for service water heating. And that's covered under Section 504 of the IECC, but we typically just kind of combine that with uh, with the mechanical requirements. The code as it stands right now in the IECC is prescriptive in nature. Um, you essentially comply with the envelope compliance um, requirements on their own, and then the mechanical, uh, the HVAC contract or mechanical designer would comply with the mechanical requirements, and the uh, the electrical or lighting designer would require um, comply with the lighting requirements of the code. And again, they're all independent of each other. Uh, there are no trade-offs in the prescriptive provisions, except you can do trade-offs using a Section 506 approach, which is uh, more of a, a building performance approach where you can trade off the inefficiencies of one system with the uh, higher efficiency levels of another system. Within each of the energy using features, for example, envelope, mechanical, or lighting, you will have two different options for getting your system to comply with the code. You can stick with Chapter 5 um, and use a Section 502 approach, for example, for envelope, a 503 approach for mechanical, or a 505 approach for the lighting system, or you have the option of using ASHRAE 90.1-2004 for any of, the, uh, any of the disciplines. So for envelope, that would be 90.1, Section 5 for mechanical 90.1 section 6, and for lighting 90.1 section 9. So if the system type falls out of the scope of Chapter 5 of the IECC, you need to go into um, 90.1-2004 and see if, it's, uh, see if it's there or change the design. You have a couple of different options on that. 
let's talk a little bit about what we mean by commercial buildings. Um, from a code standpoint, the code for commercial buildings essentially says any building that isn't a residential building, and that's not uh, not really clear in a lot of cases. Um, the residential provisions of the code um, cover R2, R3, and R4 occupancy is three stories or less in height. Uh, so any, essentially any building that's residential of uh, three stories or less would be a, a residential type of building. Um, what's not stated in the code is it also covers one or two family residential. Um, this again is not stated in the definition of residential, but it is implied by the IECC and was kind of one of the major pushes in the new residential requirements within the 2006 code. So a commercial road building would be, uh, an example, an office, retail, hotel, motel, assisted living greater than 16 occupants, um, and essentially any building um, four stories and above. Um, so if we have a 10-story condominium complex, even though they're all dwelling units, it would be considered a commercial building. Um, so you have to take a look at the project and kind of make the choice of is it residential or is it commercial, but again, any building four stories and greater is considered a, a commercial building. So once we've determined that the building is indeed commercial, then we can get into Chapter 5 of the IECC and say, okay, where, what do we need to focus on? Um, an earlier webcast um, will focus on the building envelope requirements. Today we'll look at the building mechanical requirements, and the third webcast in the series will focus on the lighting requirements of the code. Um, as we look at the building mechanical, mechanical requirements, again, we have a couple of different options for demonstrating compliance with the code. We have a Section 503 approach, which covers um, simple systems and complex systems. Um, or, if we choose, we can also use ASHRAE 90.1-2004, Section 6, as we talked about a little bit earlier. So we have a couple of different options. You can always use ASHRAE if you want to. Uh, there's nothing in the code that uh, says that it can't happen, and a lot of mechanical designers would prefer to use ASHRAE versus Chapter 5 of the IECC. But again, it's based on a preference of the, uh, of the designer and the documentation author on, on which compliance approach you want to use. From a code standpoint, um, the structure of the mechanical requirements on the code has changed, so it's actually clearer, easier to understand. There's a lot less repetition than the 2003 code, which was very confusing because the 2003 cover um, a section on simple systems and went through what we consider the mandatory requirements and then the requirements specific to simple systems and then covered complex systems and essentially repeated a lot of the same provisions. So the, um, the code was streamlined significantly and um, under the mandatory provisions, section 503.2, it lists all the mandatory provisions for all system types, uh, which makes the code a lot easier to use and a lot easier to understand. Um, then it will list the provisions only applicable to simple system types. And we're going to see that there's only really one provision that we have to focus on there, and that's going to be the economizer requirement. Um, then we can get into complex HVAC system types, and it will be the mandatory provisions plus the, the, the provisions specific to complex systems. And as we see in complex, there's going to be a lot of requirements for different control types um, and that really re eliminate um, or reduce the need to do reheat or recool, for example, and also try to latch, uh, match the output capacity of a piece of equipment uh, better with the actual load on the building to, so the systems are run as efficiently as possible. Um, section, uh, the first point, bullet point up here, what provisions does the code apply, really kind of highlight um, how the, the chapter is structured. Um, for example, on the mandatory provisions, it's, uh, you always start with the mandatory provisions um, plus either Section 503, which is simple systems, and 503.4, which is complex systems. Uh, simple systems, a uh, quick definition, we'll get into more detail on this, is essentially any system, um, a packaged unit, single zone system that serves in one zone. So it's one system serving one zone with one temperature control. Uh, so an example of that would be a, a gas electric package rooftop unit. Um, it could be a split system with a condensed unit on the outside and a furnace on the inside. So it can be a fairly simple, very simple system, but essentially one system per zone with one thermostat, and a complex system is anything else that's not considered simple. Uh, a large built-up system with a chiller and boiler, a variable air volume system, a uh, hydronic system, those types of systems are considered complex systems.
from a simple system just to kind of emphasize again what we just talked about. Um, and it is important to note the distinction on this because complex systems will have significantly more requirements than simple systems. Um, unitary or package HVAC equipment, one zone controlled by a single thermostat. This is typically the bulk of equipment that's being installed in a lot of commercial buildings, low-rise commercial buildings being built in the U.S. right now. So typically what you see at for strip shopping centers, low-rise commercial construction, will be considered simple systems. Um, a larger multi-story building to get more into the, the um, get more into the complex types of systems. So basically, the, the larger the buildings are, the, the more complex the systems can be. Even though um, I have seen a 100,000 square foot um, manufacturing facility with 70 rooftop units, so so you can have um, kind of a sea of rooftop units serving some fairly large facilities. Um, one distinction I do want to make, because we talked a little about hydronic systems and how they are considered complex, two pipe heating systems, for example, um, where there's no cooling system installed on that is considered a, a heating or a simple system. Uh, so if I have a boiler connected to fan coil units, um, that is considered by code a, a simple system. And again, complex systems are anything other than a simple system. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we get in, and we'll have a complete shopping list of the different types of systems uh, that are covered underneath complex. From a mandatory requirement standpoint, we have kind of a shopping list of items. And again, this has not really changed much since the 2003 IECC. There are a few items that we're going to add um, as we get into here. Uh, but we have to always do HVAC load calculations. It doesn't matter what type of system we're using. We Once we've done the load calculations, then we have to also size the equipment uh, to make sure it doesn't exceed the loads. There will be some exceptions on that where we can actually ex exceed the loads. Um, each piece of equipment has to meet minimum performance requirements, uh, minimum efficiency requirements for full load, and in some cases also part load values. Um, we also have to be able to control the system, and there'll be some specific requirements and the, uh, the type of temperature controls we can use, and also if we have to humidify or dehumidify. There will be requirements that we need to look at there. Something new to the code will be energy recovery ventilation systems, so we can extract the, um, the heat or cool that's being expelled from the building and actually use that, um, use that heat or cool to either preheat or precool the air coming back into the building. So we can, it will be a much more efficient system, but we'll find out that this is only going to apply to, um, to systems that, that bring in a tremendous amount of outdoor air or exhaust a tremendous amount of air. Back to plenum insulation and ceiling, this has not changed since the 2003 IECC, but there are, um, they do specify the actual UL rating for a lot of the different ceiling types that wasn't in the code before. Piping insulation is exactly the same as in the 2003 IECC, and we will take a look at that um, as we go through here. And then HVAC system completion, um, there are some requirements that were in the complex requirements last time in the 2003 code that now are for all system types, and this is essentially making sure that the um, making sure that the information to operate the system efficiently and maintain the system efficiently is applied to all system types. We are also going to be covering uh, service water heating systems within this presentation. Um, we'll, we'll take a look at some of the small service water heating requirements dealing with heat traps and also dealing with uh, piping insulation and a new requirement dealing with pool heaters and time clocks that were, uh, were not in the service water heating requirements before and now find their way into the code. So let's go ahead and start now, first of all, with the HVAC load calculation requirements. This has not changed since the 2003 code, except that the outdoor design conditions are no longer referenced in Chapter 3 as they were in the 2003 code. The code actually references ASHRAE Handbook of Fundamentals, and uh, within ASHRAE Handbook of Fundamentals for the load calculation, certain outdoor design conditions are specified for uh, winter dry bulb temperatures and also summer dry bulb and wet bulb temperatures. So again, these, these values are no longer referenced with, uh, explicitly within Chapter 3 of the code, but the code references the ASHRAE Handbook of Fundamentals, and within there, you need to use their exterior design dry bulb temperatures. You can use other co computation procedures that are approved um, by the building official, and this might be the uh, Air Conditioning Contractors Association um, ACA Manual N methodology, and approved means approved by the building official. 
Um, we talked about the exterior design conditions that are specified by ASHRAE, but something new to the code is that they actually specify the indoor design temperatures that are to be used in sizing equipment. This is something new to the code, and it essentially says that if I am sizing a heating system, the uh, highest indoor design temperature that I can have in sizing that system is 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I can always drop it down to 68 or 70, but I can only pick it up as high as 72 degrees, and for cooling, the minimum um, um, cooling temperature is 75 degrees, so I can do it at 78, 77, um, but 75 degrees is as, as cool as I can actually size that system for. So this, again, is brand new to the code. Um, the 2003 code um, basically said to size equipment based on the ASHRAE comfort envelope and let you select the indoor design temperatures for both heating and cooling. So this does provide some limits on how, um, how high you can go for heating and how cold you can go for cooling. So we've gone ahead and done our heating and cooling load calculations. The next step in the process is to go ahead and size our equipment based on the loads. If you have a unitary package system, um, single zone type of system, um, and if it is, actually if it is a package system, you would size the system based on um, the greatest loads for that building. So if I did my load calculations and saw the cooling was my predominant load in the building, I would size my package system based on the cooling load and then select the heating system um, that best matches the heating load in the space. Oftentimes what happens on this is heating becomes, uh, you end up um, over capacity on your heating based on the loads, but sometimes you don't have a lot of control on that. And that's really been kind of accepted within the IECC. For, um, for complex types of systems, uh, the code does allow you to um, install multiple pieces of equipment, basically standby equipment in case one piece of equipment breaks down. For example, in a hospital situation, you may have both a chiller and a boiler, or two chillers and two boilers. One, is, one set of equipment is actually um, meant to be used at all time. The other is for standby in case the, uh, the primary equipment breaks down or needs to be made, um, shut down for maintenance and that types of things. So you can have duplicate equipment on the roof uh, or on the building. It just has to have controls to basically lock it out uh, when one, the other piece of equipment is running. Also, there's a possibility of using uh, multiple units um, with a combined capacity that's actually over what the loads allow because if you look at the way equipment is, um, the efficiencies are, are specified in some of the equipment and the capacities are supposed to run, um, equipment runs the most efficiently at certain design capacities. So if I can, let's say my load is 25 tons, but I'm putting three 10 ton units on, um, by sequencing these pieces of equipment on as the loads on the building increase, I can actually run my system more at full load versus at part load. So I'm actually running my system more efficiently and I, the energy use is going to be dropping even though uh, overall I'll be putting in 30 tons of cooling on a 25 ton load space. But that will be allowed by code. I do have to show uh, sequencing controls on the mechanical plans to be able to do this, but um, in some cases this is the most efficient way to be, be able to operate the building. So we've done our load calculations, we've sized our equipment, now we need to make sure that the equipment meets the minimum efficiency requirements within the IECC. And there's a series of tables, I believe there's 11 tables in total that list different types of equipment um, with different minimum efficiency requirements um, for, in a lot of cases, for both fully loaded and also partly loaded. If you have two different efficiencies listed for a piece of equipment, one at full load, one at part load, the piece of equipment has to meet both the efficiency requirements. In some cases, the federal government is going to regulate um, the minimum efficiencies under the National Appliance Energy Conservation Act. So in some cases, um, you can't buy equipment that doesn't meet the minimum efficiency requirements. Um, those are specified in the footnote within the table. So you don't need to uh, worry about too much because you really can't purchase anything in the U.S. that doesn't at least meet those requirements. Um, but there's a lot of equipment that does fall out of those requirements. Um, and, the, and the tables cover anywhere from package equipment to chillers to boilers. Cooling towers are covered. Uh, package terminal air conditioners, package terminal heat pumps, um, with a fairly broad spectrum of, of equipment that you would typically see used in a commercial building. An example of one of the tables, this is table 502 point, I'm sorry, 503.2.3 for M2. 
uh, for unitary and applied heat pump electrically operated minimum efficiency requirements. Um, but you can specify the equipment type on the far left-hand column, the size category, and then over uh, on the minimum efficiency, it will tell you what the minimum efficiency for that particular piece of equipment is. Now, as I look at this table, and again, this is in the 2006 code, I notice that for a system, an air-cooled uh, system, uh, with capacity of less than 65,000 BTU, the listing for this piece of equipment is still listed at 10 sphere. Please note that as of January of, of 2006, this requirement has increased to a 13 sphere air conditioner. So this is actually incorrect within the IECC and should be a 13 sphere. Um, January, the federal government came out and said that you cannot manufacture um, any equipment in the United States that does not meet the at least the 13 tier air conditioner requirement. So that uh, that will have to be updated to a 13 tier. Just another example of an equipment efficiency table. This one is for uh, package terminal air conditioners or package terminal heat pumps that might be found in hotel, motel types of occupancies. Um, but again, you can determine what the minimum efficiency requirements should be for that type of equipment based on based on this table. So we've gone ahead, we've sized our system, um, we've selected the minimum efficiencies, and then we've made sure our, our equipment meets the minimum efficiency requirements. Now we have to determine how we're going to control the, the system. Um, and there are a set of parameters within the IECC, a set of uh, stipulations on how the thermostat should operate, what the minimum set point should be, um, that type of thing. But essentially, the, the bottom line is every zone should have a thermostat. Um, and some of the large complex systems, though, you can actually uh, you can actually have one zone for each major exposure uh, within that building. So there are some exemptions to the thermostat requirements, but the bottom line is um, the exemptions aren't that you don't have to have a thermostat. It's just how many thermostats you actually need for each particular um, for each particular zone in the building. So, but you do have to control uh, control temperature and also control the humidity levels within that building based on uh, the control schematics within the code. Heat pump systems, if you have a heat pump system, you need a heat pump thermostat. And essentially, this is for heat pump systems that have electric resistance backup. Um, so this would be for smaller smaller heat pump systems. But the code says that the, uh, electric, the heat pump thermostat would basically lock out the electric resistance backup um, if the heat pump itself can handle the load. So you're not putting your 2 or 3 kW um, electric resistance backup on when you can actually still satisfy the heating load of the building. Um, with the, through the actual heat pump cycle. Energy recovery ventilation systems. This is brand new to the IECC, and it's essentially for systems uh, with a design supply or capacity greater than 5,000 CFM and a minimum outside air supply of greater than or equal to 70% of the design supply or quantity. Significantly high amounts of outdoor air coming in, so you're bringing in a lot of outdoor air, you're exhausting a lot of outdoor air, and there's a lot of energy being wasted in these types of systems. Um, so the energy recovery um, ventilation system basically either extracts the heat from this ventilation air and uses it to preheat the air coming back into the system, or it extracts both the um, both the cool energy and also the uh, the dehumidification qualities of that air, um, and uses that to precondition the the air before it goes through the space cooling system within the building. Applications of where you might find this, and this is based on um, based on the ASHRAE 90.1 2004 Users Manual. Um, this could be used in areas with, for example, 100% outdoor air supply systems. Could be used in systems serving laboratories and institutional occupancies um, where there's a high minimum requirement for ventilation air, for example, schools and theaters. So again, this just extracts the energy from that ventilation air and it uses it to preheat and recool the air um, on, uh, for the outdoor air coming back into the building. Okay, from best employment insulation and ceiling, the requirements have not changed since the 2003 IECC, essentially for um, insulating ductwork, the code says ducts located in unconditioned space have to be an R5, ducts located completely outside the building has an R8. When we talk about completely outside the building, it's to be a duct running across the, the, the top of the roof, uh, roof deck. Um, Unconditioned space, we're looking at the picture on the right hand side here and we see the duct running above the drop ceiling. That's essentially considered unconditioned space by code. Um, so that duct would have to be uh, insulated to an R5 duct insulation. 
not only do we have to insulate the ductwork, we also have to make sure the ductwork is sealed properly because we want to make sure that the air gets from where it's being conditioned to the, the space without a lot of duct leaks or air leaks all the way through, um, all the way throughout the building. So the code has two separate requirements, uh, one based on what we call consider low to medium pressure duct systems, which are less than three inch static pressure loss. And these requirements really haven't changed. Um, from the 2003 code, it basically says you have to seal the ductwork, and it does specify all joints, longitudinal and transfer seams, and connections must be sealed. It gives you a shopping list of different sealing approaches that you can use, uh, welds, gaskets, mastics, mastic plus embedded fabric system tapes, um, but it does specify you can't use unlisted and unlabeled duct tape, and duct tape works good on your kid's sneakers, auto body repair, or airplane repair, but it doesn't work at all on ductwork. Uh, mastics plus mastic and better fabric systems are probably the best uh, the best way you can go ahead and seal the ductwork up, but there's a lot of other approved methods that can be used. Please note that ducts have to be sealed regardless of where they're located, whether they're in conditioned space, outside the building, um, or in unconditioned space. So it just says seal up the ductwork. What the code re uh, provides you this time that didn't before in the 2006 code is kind of a shopping list of the UL listings um, for the different types of um, sealant methods that are um, approved for use within the code. For example, pressure sensitive tape has to be rated with UL 181A-P, and again, this is going to have to be listed and labeled. Mastic will have a rating too, and I've been asked about the Mastic rating. That's 181A-M, and that will be listed on the top of Mastic. Um, heat sensitive tape, UL 181A-H, Flexible air ducts, pressure sensitive tape, um, UL181B-FX, and then flexible air ducts mastic, um, UL181B-M, which is different, uh, different rating than the UL181A-M. So you need to pay attention to the type of sealant you're using and make sure it is listed and labeled uh, and approved for use on the type of duct system that, uh, that you're planning on installing. For high pressure duct systems, essentially you have to seal it up. You not only have to seal it, but you also have to do an air leakage test on at least 25% of the duct system to make sure it is, uh, it meets a, um, a maximum air leakage rate of 6.0 uh, that is specified in the code. The, the air leakage, uh, the duct air leakage test is per SMACNA, um, and this will have to be submitted. Um, to the jurisdiction to make sure that you've actually done the test and the system has been rated to make sure that the system actually meets the air leakage rate of 6.0 or less. Um, so again, this will be something that the mechanical um, the HVAC contractor must perform or an independent agent must perform on the duct system. Okay, so we talked about duct sealing and duct insulation. Now let's look at HVAC piping itself. Um, and essentially the code requires any piping that is not um, part of a, a, um, a rated system, uh, like not part of a, uh, a furnace, for example, or an air conditioner uh, that's rated as part of the efficiency within that system, it has to be insulated um, for table 503.2.8. And this duct insulation table is identical to the table that was in the 2003 IECC, and it's essentially rated um, the thickness is based on the fluid that's actually going through the duct system and then the, the pipe diameter. Um, so you can see the higher pipe diameters, the greater than one and a half inches, will have a higher thickness of insulation required um, than the lower uh, diameter duct or lower diameter piping will have. Um, what's important to note down here is that this um, piping insulation thickness and the, the actual conductivity of the R value is. Um, rated on a, a 0.27 BTU per inch thickness of um, piping insulation. This equates to about an R3.7 per inch thickness. Uh, so for chilled water or brine systems, for example, um, for less than one and a half inches, you would need about an R3.7 or one inch of R3.7 per inch thickness. Um, and again, the R3.7 is the minimum value, so uh, anything above beyond that would, um, would comply with the IECC. So this is going to apply to chiller and boiler systems where you have piping leading from the chiller and boiler going out to, to the zones. Uh, so you'd have a hot water system or a chilled water or brine or refrigerant system, and based on that, that pipe size, um, you can go ahead and determine how much insulation you'll need to comply with the energy code.
exemptions on this, and we'll run through briefly. Internal pipe rate, uh, piping factory installed and tested. This would be actually in the system itself. It's already rated as far as the minimum efficiency for that particular piece of equipment. Piping for fluid that we considered not to be conditioned between 55 degrees and 105 degrees Fahrenheit. That's, that's, um, that's for, again, fluid that we don't consider to be conditioned fluid. Um, piping for fluid not heated or cooled by electricity or fossil. This is going to be solar on a solar system, even though it still makes sense to insulate that piping. The code does not require it. And then piping. Uh, run-out piping less than four foot in length, uh, one inch in diameter between the control valve and the HVAC coil is not required to be insulated by code. Manuals are now required to be um, submitted actually at time of final for any system type. Um, the 2003 code only specified this for complex systems to essentially provide O&M manuals and, and um, information on how the system is supposed to be operated and maintained um, to the building owner or the facilities manager, uh, but now this is going to apply both to simple systems and to complex systems. Um, you're only going to get the energy savings out of that piece of equipment if the piece of equipment is actually maintained properly and if the facilities manager or the owner knows how to properly operate that. Um, for example, studies were done in California. Um, for economizers, showing about 70% of the economizers uh, that were reviewed down there did not operate properly, and that's a lot of wasted energy savings. So O&M manuals, uh, operation and maintenance manuals are critical to make sure that, um, that you actually can uh, have the information in front of you to be able to operate that, that system efficiently. So. This shopping list, equipment capacity and required maintenance, uh, equipment O&M manuals, HVAC system control maintenance and calibration information, and most importantly, a written narrative of each system operation is going to be required for all system types now, not just for complex systems. That ends the mandatory requirements that apply to all systems. Now we're going to look at the specific requirements for simple HVAC systems that we've been talking about earlier. And again, a simple HVAC system is a, a unitary single zone system, one system serving one zone controlled by one thermostat. And it includes a wide variety of system types we discussed earlier, unitary package cooling systems, split system cooling, package terminal air conditioning, um, split system heating, a unit heater in a warehouse, for example, unitary package heating is considered a simple system, fuel fired furnace where we might find these in small office buildings, um, two pipe heating systems with no cooling is also considered a simple system. So this is kind of the shopping list of what falls underneath the simple system requirements by code. One of the major changes that happened in the 2006 IECC that does affect um, some of the mechanical requirements is the country was divided up into a new set of climate zones. Uh, before the 2003, we had 19 climate zones. This has been truncated down to essentially eight primary climate zones. Each climate zone, though, has been split up into um, uh, subcategories based on levels of humidity and moisture in the area. We have a marine climate zone, which would be uh, kind of focused on the uh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, down into Northern California, a dry climate zone, which is going to be the more the mountain states and high desert types of states, and then a moist climate zone, uh, climate zone A, which will be um, higher humidity levels of moisture, and then we also have the warm humid below, um, the warm humid area down below, uh, which is going to be about a lot more humid than other parts of the country, um, a little more consistently. So this climate zone map now plays into the economizer requirements. Um, that we have for both the complex and mechanic, uh, simple systems. So let's take a look at the economizer requirements. The climate zone table, uh, the requirements have changed from the 2003 IECC. For one of those, the biggest change is the fact that um, the 2003 IECC stated that a system 65,000 BTUs or greater had to have an economizer. That has been dropped now down to 54,000 BTU per hour. So this is actually going to capture more equipment um, that's going to be required actually as the economizer. Um, there's still several climate zones that are not required to have the economizer. These are typically fall underneath the, the hot humid types, uh, 1A, 1B, 2A, 3A, and 4A, um, and uh, the moist, 
flight's climate zone for where you actually uh, would use probably more energy to dehumidify the air, um, and the, the energy saving system isn't there to put in the economizer. And then also the very cold climate zone, climate zone 7 and 8, is exempted from the economizer requirement. But the rest of the country will have to have economizers. Um, a lot of the dry areas, um, um, marine zones and things like that would also have to have economizers. And so in climate zone um, 3B, 2B, 3C, 4B, and you can read the, the table, um, the cutoff on that will be 54,000 BTU, and then climate zone 5A and 6A, um, the economizer requirement will start at 135,000 BTU per hour uh, on the system larger than that. There is still the ability to trade off the economizer with higher efficiency equipment. Um, it's, it's stated differently than what was in the 2003 IECC. Now it's based on climate zone, and there's only three climate zones you can get the trade off in 2B, 3B, or 4B. And it's based on percent efficiency improvement over the minimum efficiency of that particular piece of equipment listed in the efficiency tables within the IECC. So, for example, 3B, if you install a piece of equipment that's 15% more efficient than the minimum requirement, either for the EER, the energy efficiency ratio, or the integrated part load value, then you can trade that economizer off and you don't have to install that economizer on the system. Uh, now, this table, 503.3.1 print 2, and also the previous table, is also used to determine the economizer requirements for complex air systems, as well as we'll take a look at. From a complex system standpoint, um, essentially, from a code standpoint, anything that's not a simple system is considered complex. Um, so the shopping list for complex systems would include all the variable air volume system types uh, for package, uh, for example, built up um, single zone dual duct VAB, packaged or built up package dual fan dual duct VAB. So it's essentially if it's a variable air volume system or one system serving multiple zones, it's considered a complex system. Hydronic systems, it would include a four pipe um, fan coil system, actually a two pipe fan coil system with a chiller and boiler connected on would be considered a complex system. Um, hydronic heat pump systems with a central plant, maybe a chiller and a boiler, or any, um, um, any system type like that would be considered complex. Um, so you can kind of look at the shopping list and determine what a, a complex system would be. But essentially it's uh, multiple zones, uh, large built-up systems, the systems that are significantly more complex on how they go together than, um, than uh, putting a package rooftop unit onto a system and then calling it good, or onto a building and calling it good. There is an economizer requirement on the complex system, essentially the same for air system as we looked at for simple systems, and essentially we use the same tables, 503.3.1, paren 1, and paren 2. Again, the first table will tell you what climate zones you need an economizer in based on system size um, and climate zone. The second table will tell you when you can, when you're allowed to trade that off. So if, it's, if you're putting an airside economizer on, you would use the same tables we just looked at. If, though, you decide to use a water side economizer, so you're actually using your cooling power as your economizer, through your economizer um, for your the, the water side portion of the system, um, the system has to be capable of providing 100% of the cooling load a 50 degree dry bulb, a 45 degree wet bulb. Um, now, the system we're showing here in the diagram is one example of a system that would comply with the code. Certainly, it's not the only example, and you have to select the best system for your configuration, also for your maintenance needs and that type of thing. So, for water side, you can use that, or you can go with the air side system um, and meet the requirements that are contained in the simple system requirements. From a code standpoint, where we get into the, kind of the, the intent of what the code is trying to get at, um, for one thing, it really sounds heavily on simultaneous heating or cooling or doing any kind of reheat or recooling. So the code really tries to get you not to condition air, for example, um, maybe cool it down to 55 degrees and then reheat it back up to um, to um, be able to heat a space. Um, so that you're, you're using energy to cool the air to one temperature, and then you're using more energy to reheat that air. So there's a lot of provisions within the code that really try to focus on not 
not getting you to do that, but using energy more efficiently within the space. The code also recognizes <clears throat> that when you do your heating and cooling load calculations, you're sizing your systems for worst case conditions. So in the middle of the summertime, um, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on, a, on an hot August day, um, with the building fully loaded with people and with all the lights on in the building and all the equipment operating, you're going to be sizing your chillers to be able to handle that worst case condition. Um, or in the middle of the winter time when it's um, below zero outside, there's no one in the building, there's no lights on, um, and there's no equipment on, you're sizing your boiler to be able to handle that extreme load. Typically, you're not going to find those two extremes through most of the year. So what happens is we install equipment to meet the extreme loads when, in fact, our building is only poorly loaded most of the year. So the code actually puts control requirements in place to be able to better match the equipment capacity with the actual load on that building at that particular time. And as we go through here, you'll see that a lot of the, co the uh, provisions are really focused on getting the equipment output capacity to better match the load so it operates more efficiently and you're not, uh, you're not running equipment at um, a significantly higher rates than actually need to happen. So one of the first requirements we'll take a look at is if you have multiple package boiler systems, um, you need to have automatic controls capable of sequencing the operation of those boilers. So in this schematic down here, we have boiler one and we have boiler two. If the load on the building can actually be handled adequately with boiler one without turning boiler two on, the controls would basically lock out boiler two and until the load got to a point where the second boiler would have to come on. So you need to be able to provide controls that, that will sequence the operation. So you're only running what you actually need to get the space conditioning. If I have one large boiler, and in this case, uh, the code specifies greater than 500,000 BT per hour, the boiler has to be multi-stage or modulating burner. And this allows the boiler capacity to go up or down based on the needs of the building. Um, so, for example, when the, the load comes on, it might um, the boiler might kick on at 50% capacity um, and be able to operate at that point until the load on the building increases, and then the, the uh, boiler might step up to 75% capacity, and then it might step up to a full 100% capacity. But again, it works better to better match the um, better match the output capacity of the boiler system with what's actually going on in, in the building. There's also a requirement for temperature reset, um, and essentially, if I have a boiler system and the load on the building is significantly less than what we've sized it for. Um, the boiler system can actually drop the temperature of the water, so instead of heating um, heating water up to 180 degrees, for example, maybe it'll step it down to 170 degrees, and it actually um, has to use as less energy to heat that water up to a lower temperature, so you're saving energy that way, plus you're pumping cooler, cooler water through the piping system, which actually reduces your line losses, so it's a tremendous amount of energy savings that way. On the flip side of your cooling system, it also, temperature reset's also required on your cooling system, and if I can cool my water down to, for example, 60 degrees versus Versus, um, versus 55 degrees or 50 degrees, um, it actually uses less energy to reduce the temperature of the water. And again, I'm running slightly warmer water through the lines, which means my line losses are going to be less, and I'll be able to save energy that way. So I can use temperature reset to be able to comply with this provision of the code, or I can also use um, an adjustable speed drive, for example, uh, to reduce the pump, the actual amount of um, flow through the pumping through the water system. Um, so I'm focused on putting an adjustable speed or variable speed drive motor on my pumping system to be able to actually reduce the uh, reduce the pumping energy. There's a tremendous amount, of, tremendous amount of energy being used in commercial building these days with electric motors. And if we can use, operate these motors at a significantly lower power draw, we will save a lot of energy within the building. So an adjustable speed or a variable speed drive is a, a good strategy to do that. The multiple chilled uh, Multiple chiller chilled water plants. Um, again, if we we need to be able to operate these and sequence these efficiently. So if I have multiple chilled water plants, I need to be able to sequence the operation of these similar to um, similar to our boiler. So if Chiller one, for example, down here in the schematic can handle the load on its own. I will keep chiller two locked off until the load increases, and then I will go ahead and turn chiller two on. Now, if these are plumbed in sequence so that you need the capacity, um, you don't have to have this type of an operation system on there. But typically, if they're plumbed in parallel, um, you can go ahead and sequence the operation of the chillers and um, 
and actually better match the output capacity of the system with uh, with the load on the building. Something that's been in the 2003 IECC um, and it's also appearing in the 2006 is basically for fan powered, uh, each fan powered by a motor greater than or equal to seven and a half horsepower to have the capability to operate that fan at two thirds of full power or full speed or less. Um, so basically trying to um, uh, trying to put in a multiple speed motor that can actually uh, save a significant amount of energy operating at a lower fan speed uh, than if the fan is running full out on this. And this is going to apply to um, air cooled condensers, um, open cooling towers are a couple of examples of where this will apply to. The exemption on this one is when the fan system, the fan power motor, is actually in a system that's already rated, it has an efficiency rated that appears in the tables, uh, the efficiency tables in the code 503. 0.3.2 paren 1 or 503.3.2 uh, paren 11. Uh, other multiple system zone requirements. If I have an air system serving multiple zones, the code requires me to use a variable air volume system. Um, this is found to be the most effective in serving several zones at one time and essentially modulates the airflow to the space. Um, to be able to satisfy the loads on the building. Now, with a variable air volume system, typically the air is um, conditioned to 55 degrees Fahrenheit and sent to all of the zones um, at one constant temperature. In some cases, the 55 degree air um, or Fahrenheit air temperature will meet the cooling requirements of all the zones, but sometimes on perimeter zones, uh, you need to heat the air versus cool the air because the perimeter zones here in the wintertime are directly affected by the exterior, uh, what's going on on the outside of the building. So if you're in the middle of the winter, the perimeter zones will probably be calling for heating, not cooling. So once the 55 degree air gets to that perimeter zone space, it will have to be reheated oftentimes to satisfy the load. We talked a little bit about this before, but the code basically um, is trying to get you the designer to drastically reduce the amount of reheat, uh, which is typically going to be installed in a variable air volume system. Uh, but reducing the amount of reheat that's used in that building, uh, reheat is provided either by electric resistance or a, a boiler system, a hot water boiler system. Um, so reduce the amount of reheat um, within the space. And from a variable air volume standpoint, if I reduce the airflow into the space, I reduce the amount of 55 degree air going into the space, I can actually heat my space with internal loads in the space through uh, people, lighting, and equipment. Um, and I can almost satisfy the heating load for that space with internal loads. But if I can't, the code says I have to reduce the amount of airflow to that space before I turn my reheat coil on. So I have a couple of options I have. One is to uh, reduce the airflow down to 30% of the maximum supply air to each zone. Another option that may be more commonly taken is the minimum ventilation requirements from the IMC. So I'd reduce my airflow to that space to the minimum ventilation requirements for the IMC before I turn my reheat coil on. Now there are several exemptions for variable air volume systems. Um, either having the systems not for that particular zone or not installing the DAD system at all for the particular building type. Uh, the first one on the uh, zones with special pressurization or cross-contamination requirements, this might be a hospital situation where the DAD system does not work correctly and, and you need um, you have special pressurization to either a negatively, a negatively pressurized space or positively pressurized space that you may not be able to get that kind of control with the DAD type of systems. Um, zones with special humidity requirements, for example, uh, the humidity controls with VAV systems are getting better, but if you have specific humidity requirements that can't be met by a VAV system, then you uh, don't have to use um, a VAV system on that. Um, and there's also, a, obviously, there's where 75% of the reheat energy comes from site recovered or site solar energy sources. Um, then you can use reheat um, without reducing the airflow to those particular spaces. So again, there's a shopping list of the types of exemptions that can be used, um, either from the zone by zone standpoint or system uh, building by building standpoint, when the variable air volume systems do not have to be used. Staying on the theme of variable air volume systems, if you have individual fans with motors greater than 25 horsepower, these motors have to be driven by a mechanical electrical variable speed drive. 
or you have to change the fan system to either be a main axial fan with variable pitch blades, or kind of the intent behind this whole thing is to reduce the fan motor demand to less than or equal to 30% of the design wattage at 50% of the design airflow. This is a key thing with the variable air volume system because you modulate the flow of air through the system to satisfy the loads. If I can satisfy the loads with the airflow by reducing my motor draw, I'm saving a significant amount of energy. So um, typically a variable air volume system would use a variable frequency drive to be able to satisfy the loads. And, but again, the intent is less than or equal to 30% of the design wattage or 50% of the design airflow. There's also a requirement for heat recovery service hot water heating that was in the 2003 code. Essentially, for large systems, you can take the waste heat um, and use that, um, use that to, to condition um, a, a very high hot water need that might be used in something like a, a hospital dormitory um, or a hotel. A hotel, for example, and hospital, you might have very high laundry needs for, uh, for hot water. So this would actually be used to precondition the water um, and not hot water, um, hot water usage for, for very high hot water needs um, where you have um, quite a bit of waste heat that you can actually collect. Okay, that ends the mandatory requirements and also the specific requirements for the mechanical system. Um, and you can see that the set of mandatory requirements really have not changed much between the 2003 and 2006 code. Um, and actually, the specific requirements for uh, simple systems have, have, are pretty much the same. Um, and we've only added a couple of specific requirements for complex systems, but essentially the requirements will uh, pretty much stay the same as they were in the 2003 IECC. The next few slides we're going to be focusing on now is the service water heating requirements within the code. And again, these kind of get coupled together between mechanical and service water heating. Um, and the requirements for service water heating really have not changed um, a lot since the 2003 code. We'll see they have added requirements for pool space heating and, and for, um, for pumping energy now that weren't in the code before but were in the residential provisions. First requirement for service water heating is that the water heater that's installed meets the minimum equipment performance efficiency requirements that are in Table 504.2. And 504.2 lists uh, several different types of water heaters and also um, the fuel source to the water heaters. For example, electric storage, um, gas and oil storage, instantaneous. Um, and it also has minimum efficiency requirements for pool heaters. Um, and pool heaters are covered underneath um, the IECC, and we'll get into that in a couple of slides. Um, in a lot of cases, you can't buy a water heater that does not meet the minimum efficiency requirements that are in um, Table 504.2 because they're covered underneath the National Appliance Energy Conservation Act. So this is uh, the first requirement with water heating. The second requirement with water heating is how the water heater is actually plumbed. And there's two different types of systems you can encounter in a commercial building. One is uh, a non-circulating system, which would really look more like um, a residential application um, where you do not have a pump and you are not circulating water through that space. Um, you can have instant hot water at the tap. So for non-circulating systems, you have to insulate the first eight feet of the output and inlet piping into that water heater tank uh, with one half pitch of piping insulation. Um, so that's the, the only place in the code that this is actually going to come up because it's not, not a requirement right now in the residential provisions of the code. For circulating systems, and this is where you have a pump connected and you're actually circulating hot water through a loop to the building. All of the circulation of loop has to be insulated to one inch of insulation. It doesn't matter where that circulation loop is located, whether it's in conditioned space or unconditioned space. Um, about the only allowance for not insulating that pipe is if that pipe runs through an insulated wall system and actually the insulation provides the one inch of insulation. Uh, but anywhere that circulation loop is set has to be insulated to one inch. Requirement on a circulating systems uh, where you will have a pump. This picture shows a very small circulation pump installed on the circulation loop. You have to be able to turn that pump on and off either automatically or manually. 
the manual portion is a change from the 2003 IECC, which basically said that you needed an automatic means to turn the pump on and off. So actually, a on-off switch located next to the pump um, it would satisfy the provisions of the code. Um, it's probably not the most effective use of that, and actually the uh, time clock is a much better use because um, oftentimes people forget to turn the pump off, so it, it could be running all night if you didn't have some kind of a, an automatic control on there. But the code will allow you to install a manual control to comply with the energy code. Okay, so that takes care of the actual service water heating portion. Now we'll take a look at the new pool requirements um, that have always been in the residential provisions of the IECC and has just uh, currently got this way into the, uh, the commercial provisions of the code. First requirement is for pool heaters, and essentially the code requires you to have a readily accessible on-off switch on a pool heater, which makes sense because um, you need to be able to uh, turn the pump anyway off if, if you have to service it or want to disconnect it. Um, or if you just want to turn up the um, turn the pool heater off um, because you don't want to operate it all day. Um, also, from a pool heater standpoint, again, we looked at the fact that that is regulated and it does have minimum efficiency requirements. Um, and also cannot have a continuously burning pilot light on your gas-fired pool heater. So that is a requirement in the code. So no standing pilot lights. It has to be some kind of an electronic ignition on the um, on the gas-fired pool heater. So that's the pool heater requirements. Now there's also requirements for time switches. Um, and the first requirement is that you need an automatic control that can operate the pool heater and the pumps on a preset schedule. Oftentimes, you do not want your pool heater running 24 hours a day, or you don't want your pumps operating 24 hours a day because of the tremendous amount of energy you see. Or you will have those cycling on and off. There are some exemptions to that. Um, one of the exemptions for public health standards require 24-hour operation. You would need to check with the jurisdiction on that to determine if that is a requirement um, within the code itself, the adopted code for that specific jurisdiction. Um, also, we're using pumps to operate solar and waste heat recovery pool heating systems. So if I'm heating my my pool via solar, for example, um, I may not want the automatic controls on there to be able to operate those pumps. I may not want a different type of control on there, so you would be able to exempt that. Last but not least for pools is the fact that all pools that are heated must have a vapor retardant pool cover. And this is a new term used in the code, a vapor retardant pool cover. Uh, but essentially, most of the heat loss from a heated pool is through evaporation. And studies have shown that you can save up to 50% of the energy use of heating that pool with a pool cover. Um, this requirement has been in the residential provisions on the last few codes, and has now just made its way to the commercial, uh, commercial provisions covering swimming pools or commercial installations. The other requirement is for pools heated to over 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and this is really going to cover uh, the connected spa tubs and things like that for a, um, a pool installation. And what this is saying is that you need a pool cover with a minimum of an R12 insulation installed in that pool cover. So you need an insulated pool cover um, for spa tubs or for very, you know, for pools if you actually had a pool heated over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, that does it for me. Um, I hope that uh, you got out a lot out of this presentation. Again, feel free to ask any questions via email, and we'll get those answered for you in fairly short order. Um, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Pam now to wrap things up. Thanks a lot. Again, if you have questions and comments, there's two avenues to do that. I gave you the tech support email that you can take down. And then if you forget that or you don't write it down, if you go out to our website, there is a help desk online electronic form that you can go to fill out your name, and submit your question that way, and they come right in, and we will answer them. That ends this portion. Thank you for attending our session today. This ends the training video. If you would like to take the test to receive AIA credit and or print a certificate of completion, please write down the URL shown on the screen. You will need to type this URL into your Internet browser. Thank you.